you know, he's he's very well known in, in reinforcement learning. Um, and you know, you you can do this by trying to do a Google search for any topic in reinforcement learning. And you know, he's going to have some paper uh, that comes up in the top ten or so. So so very well known in reinforcement learning. Um, he's you know a professor at UT Austin. Has had many many of his uh, academic children go off to do really interesting things um, at interesting places, and and he's been uh, been uh, the director of Sony AI uh, most recently, uh, which which is a really interesting uh, move for him uh, uh, into the practical space. But he he's been doing practical work as well for a long time. Uh, you know this uh, the uh, the RoboCop challenge. So so working with real robots, getting real systems to work with uh, with RL, and so I think we're going to hear a little bit of more more about that today. Um, and I will just let uh, Peter take it over. Great, thank you very much, Alan, and thanks everybody for uh, for being here. Um, I know it's late for um, for many of you. Um, this is a this is a great topic for a, for a workshop, so I'm really really glad to have this uh, this come together. Um, on the other hand, it was really difficult for me to think about what I would actually talk about um, in you know in bridging the gap, and um, so I'll, I'll sort of lead into that. But I guess before I do that, I'll say that the the work that I did cho choose to to um, talk about today um, is joint with the people you see here. Yu Chen Zhang is a current uh, current PhD student in my lab. Um, and uh, doing great work for her thesis and really the basis for most, much of what I'll talk about today. And so she's, she's a real star. Um, Xi Yun Lo is, is a PhD student in Andrea Tomas's lab. Um, Xu Qi Zhang used to be a postdoc in my lab and is now at SUNY Binghamton. Fang Kai Yang um, was a PhD student of Vladimir Lifshitz here at UT Austin. And Matteo Leonetti was a postdoc in my, my lab and is now a professor at University of Leeds. And so um, none of this could have happened without, without all of them. So planning and reinforcement learning, like I say, it's a great, great topic. And I'm actually, um, I've done a lot of work that's in planning and, um, and that's actually where I started. My first, the first paper I ever published as a, as a graduate student uh, was in 1994 at the APES conference before there was even ICAPS, um, AI planning systems conference. And, um, and then I quickly moved during my PhD thesis into reinforcement learning. And I've always sort of, you know, th they're, in many ways, um, trying to, as you all know, trying to solve the same kind of problem. What action should you take? What should you do in the current state? Um, and what, well, what should you do over time toward to, to reach to achieve your goal? On the other hand, they are very different and there is a gap between them. And so it does make sense to have this, um, a workshop about trying to bridge the gap um, on one hand. But as, as you know, I've, I've prepared these slides and then was really happy to see that the discussion sort of went this way and Alan said it in the, in the previous, in his invited talk as well, that a lot of, um, you know, RL researchers patch planning, you know, quote planning into reinforcement learning and, you know, call it model-based reinforcement learning, do Monte Carlo tree search, but it's not really what we think of as, as planning in most cases. Of course, you know, there's some, there's some work that is, you know, um, that is relational. There's been relational reinforcement learning um, as, you know, as far back as 15 or 20 years ago. Um, but, it, but most of it is, you know, planning to reinforcement learning people often just means model-based reinforcement learning. And doesn't really use all the machinery we think of in, as in in planning. Um, and then on the flip side, you know, there's planning researchers that sort of patch RL into into planning. Um, and uh, you know, in some ways, this is if you're doing planning and you start learning from execution, um, you take some actions that up, updates your your domain model in some way. Well, then that's that's learning. And uh, and but that's you know, it's often not with a value function, not with temporal difference updates. So RL people would say, well, yeah, that's not really RL. So you have, you know, planning people or RL people that are doing planning in a way that maybe planning people wouldn't accept. You have planning people doing RL in a way that RL people maybe wouldn't accept. Um, I've done work in, you know, coming from both of these directions. I'm going to actually talk today. Both of the previous invited talks, I, I would sort of characterize as being in this this first camp as as. Um, starting from RL and trying to bring planning into RL, I'm not in the sense of, you know, I'm not going to, I wouldn't say it's, uh, I think it's great work. It's, we are trying to do it, but it was starting from the RL side. 
I'm going to talk today instead of, of um, you know, sort of starting from the planning side and trying to add some learning into it. But it's there is still a gap. It's not going to get all the way there. And so I just start by saying, you know, is there really a gap to bridge? Or are these for different purposes? I mean, I do agree that an autonomous agent should be able to do reinforcement learning and it should be able to plan. Um, but maybe, you know, we should consider that they're not the same thing that they're, you know, and, and it, it actually reminds me there's a there's a paper from um, lots of authors. I know Francesca Rossi and some of her colleagues at IBM and several others that was just accepted into the AAAI um, blue sky track on, on um, thinking flat, fast and slow. Um, and uh, just like, you know, the Kahneman has his thinking fast and slow for humans, maybe Maybe the you know planning is the slow, the thinking slow, and the and the RL is the you know sort of the thinking fast for more reactive kinds of things without the, as much the much look ahead. And maybe that's okay. Um, and uh, you know, so they they may be for different purposes. But but uh, in any case, what I'm going to do today is is um, give a talk that I think is very different from the previous two because it's going to start uh, from the from the planning side more and uh, and just bring in some some forms of learning. Um, and it's going to be in the robotics domain, as my title uh, definitely foreshadowed. It's, um, I'm going to uh, talk about mobile service robots um, you know, with, with, that have goals such as deliver co uh, coffee to, to Alice's room. These are pictures of, our, um, of some of the robots that we, uh, that we have in my lab. In fact, I'll show some videos of them um, working. Uh, this is... Um, some joint work with, uh, with Ray, my colleague Ray Mooney and, um, and some other colleagues um, where we have these robots that just are always wandering around our hall. If you come to the, the computer science building at UT Austin, you usually don't have to ask us for a demo, at least when it's not a pandemic. There's usually these robots, um, robots like these ones just, just uh, wandering around the halls. This particular video is some research on grounded language learning where the robots learning from experience how to interpret natural language as, as people engage in dialogue um, with it. But it's, I'm mainly showing this just to have you uh, see the, um, the video. And then this, uh, this Toyota HSR robot we also have. In fact, it was the subject of a, um, of a paper we had at ICAPS last year. Um, I think the sound here will work. Let's see. Um, Hello, how can I help you? Bring me the fruit from the kitchen. And I'm going to speed this up. Um, so it's you can't you won't hear it while it's while it's speeding up. Um, but you see the subtitles. And this was this was work that we had in the in ICAPS last year on um, basically planning with hypothetical knowledge. So uh, the the so Yu Chen, that's the so Yu Chen Zhang is the student who was just uh, talking to the robot there. Um, she said, "Go bring me the apple from the kitchen." But the um, the robot doesn't know if there is an apple in the kitchen. So it's it, it's you know it's not a closed world, and it has to um, look around in places. And uh, and then once it does find the um, once it does find the apple, it instantiates. It sort of takes the hypothetical apple that it that it uh, hypothesized from the request and uh, grounds it with the um, the apple that it perceives, and then um, is able to go and uh, take it. Um, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Oops. Um, I wanted to just let you hear it. So here it is delivering the apple. Please be ready to accept the object in three, two, one. And you'll see this is not human robot interaction research. We could definitely work, uh, work on the interface. Um, but, uh, but in any case, if there, we also considered the case where it, it would not have found an apple, right? So it's in the, the, you know, the robot would go and look in the kitchen and that's where it decided it would look It then returns and infers that there could not be an app, that there wasn't an apple. I could not and again, the task due to inconsistent hypotheses from your request. I assumed a hypothetical apple at the kitchen, but that turned out to be false. So again, I won't uh, won't claim that this is good human robot interface, uh, in, you know, human robot interaction. Of course, the, the the text and the words could have been smoother. But the point is that, that we have these robots that are able to move around the world and um, and you know try to do to satisfy requests like this. So what I'm gonna I'm gonna actually talk about several pieces of work in this in this talk that that integrate 
task, the, the task planning, the motion planning, and the learning that has to happen to do tasks like this. So our goal is to, to, um, uh, to integrate these things. So we have a task planner that, that can um, decide that you're going to go to the, pick, the kitchen, pick up the coffee, go to Alice's room and deliver it. That's sort of the traditional late level of abstraction for, uh, for planning. But we also need to have a, a motion planner that can actually come up with continuous control commands, the velocities um, and angular velocity to try to go to the kitchen, pick up the coffee, do those kinds of things. And it may, and the, the you know, the, the, we may, the task planner may not know how long the motion planner would actually think that, that actions would take. And then we also want to be able to learn from execution. And so I'm going to actually show sort of a series of things, one that integrates task and motion planning, one that integrates task planning with, with this cost learning, and then one that, that tries to put all of these together. So, so the motivation here is that we have a robot shown in the red circle here. It's got a goal. Um, and it can come up with a symbolic plan of go to D4, then D1, then then you know then and go through the doorway and go into the goal. Um, but then, as it tries to execute these, it may find out that uh, that this hallway that it was planning to go is is often very crowded. Maybe it's you know one that that people walk down when they're coming out of class, and so maybe it learns um, that there are other plans that that might work better in practice. And so our problem is how can we generate low cost task, task motion plans and adapt to domain changes um, caused by crowds of people or changes in furniture layout or closed doors. Um, and uh, it's just, you know, it's not practical to, to model everything uh, accurately for these planners. So that's where the, the learning is motivated. So um, I'm gonna start by describing a, um, a, a paper with, uh, with Xiun Lo and, and Xu Qi um, Zhang on, called Petlon, um, where we put together just task and motion planning. So there was no learning in this case, no, ex, uh, no learning from the environment. Um, it's a paper that, that won a, the best robotics paper award at Amos in 2018 and was recently just published in AIJ. And, um, and it's gonna come up with a task level optimal um, plan for robot navigation and then uh, use the motion planner to estimate the cost of navigation. And there'll be a loop that I'll show here. Then I'm gonna talk about some work with Matteo Leonetti that was in AIJ 2016, that's integrating um, the, uh, the task planner with reinforcement learning in a particular way, which I'll, which I'll talk about. So, so first Petlon, um, the idea here is that, you know, uh, the, the motivation here is that the robot needs to move to bring milk and a newspaper to, to the storage bin. Um, in order to complete the optimal plan, it has to come up with a sequence of actions at the task level. But the robot needs to, um, if it, it, it first has to, to evaluate all, its, all the action costs. How long will it take me to get from point A to point B with the, the relevant points? And if there's only a few you know, possible items in the world, then it could just do that. It could just say, what are all the possible paths from all possible objects? What are those costs? And then plan using a, a traditional planner. But if the domain gets bigger, you may have tons of different um, possible uh, costs of, of actions. And the, um, you can only find out how long they'll actually take by running a motion planner. It might, you might think that it's you know, going from here, from the beginning straight to the fridge is a, is a quick thing to do, but it turns out there's an obstacle. The motion planner says it takes longer. And so we wanna be able to try to come up with the optimal task level plan but without having to invoke the motion planner to do all of the you know, sort of combinatorially many um, possible um, evaluations. And uh, yeah, that's what I just said. So, um, so Petlon basically is, is, it avoids evaluating all of these costs of, of the navigation actions while still producing a task level optimal solution. I'll, I'll give you sort of the overview of how it does that. Um, it'll, it starts by um, using a heuristic heuristic costs for getting from where it is to the, to the goal. And, um, and then, uh, and so it finds the, the optimal plan in task space, task plan space. Um, then it invokes the motion planner and says, how long does it actually take to get from where I am to the cooler, from the cooler to the fridge? And that turns out to be um, always, we, we assume an admissible heuristic. So, so that's gonna be uh, no shorter than the, than the heuristic cost was. Um, and then says, okay, well then now I've at least those previously optimal actions, the ones I thought were optimal, I now know how much they cost. So let me try replanning with these, those revised class costs and my other heuristic costs, um, come up with another one, evaluate the 
motion, um, the motions in that plan and go on until we get to the point where our optimal task plan, um, once we evaluate all of the links on the optimal task plan, it doesn't lead to um, a new, a, a new, a new plan once we know the the actual motion costs, and then we're and then we're done, and we can prove that that uh, by only event, that, that we do get the same the optimal plan um, in task space as if we had the true costs, but we don't have to evaluate the motion planner for all of them. Um, and so we do in in the paper we have a bunch of uh, we have a bunch of experiments, and we can show that um, that indeed that we can we can come up with the optimal solution when we use the, um, the true costs. Um, if, you, if we do a brute force evaluation um, of all of the motion, the motion planner costs, then we do get the optimal plan, but it takes a lot longer. Um, if we just use our you know, um, admissible heuristic, we can plan very quickly, but we get a suboptimal plan and Petlon sort of shows up here in the, um, in the, in, as a good trade-off between them. Still the, the optimal plan, but much more quickly. Um, so that's an overview of this integration of task and motion planning, but no learning. All of that is done sort of in the agent's um, uh, brain, so to speak. And then it, once it has the optimal plan, it just goes and executes it as in, in classical planning when there's no mixed execution. Um, but then uh, the next piece of work is, is Darling, which does, um, it does integrate task planning and, and learning by using a task planner to limit the, the reinforcement learning action space. And this was a very nice idea by Matteo Leonetti. Um, you know, the, uh, the motivation is, is that, you know, planning will plan to find, to, to go through this door. It finds that it's, uh, that it's not open. It can't open it because it doesn't have an arm. So it replans and comes up with exactly the same plan again, right? It doesn't learn. It doesn't change its domain model from its, from its experience. And so what we want to be able to do is, is to deal with that. Um, and so um, the caricature of, of Darling, and again, I'm giving high level views of these, these algorithms. You can find the details in the papers, but you know, RL um, basically to find the optimal solution is going to have to explore the entire domain, right? It has to find out in, in, in theory, when it's in this state here, if it moves left, that could teleport it to the goal. Um, and it could, you know, so it has to try all the actions before it can find the optimal plan. Planning, of course, relies on the domain model and just goes straight to the goal. But if there was a wall here, a red wall that it didn't know about, then the plan's going to fail. So what we do in Darling is instead, we find all the plans that are within some um, sort of relaxation constant of the optimal plan by planning. So all of them that are no longer than 1.5 times as long as the optimal plan, say. And then we only consider actions that um, for which there is at least one plan in that space of nearly optimal plans. Um, and then we do reinforcement learning in that smaller space. And so then, you know, you see there's a whole bunch of possible plans that it considers. Um, it finds the one that tries to go through this wall doesn't work, but it finds one that, that does work. And so that's the, um, that's the idea of, um, of Darling is sort of being in, the, in between reinforcement learning and, and planning. And the way it, it merges them is by using the planning to restrict the space in which we need to do um, reinforcement learning. So, um, so those are you know, sort of, like I said, task and motion planning, um, and then uh, task planning that, that gets the benefit of learning. Um, now I'm going to talk about a paper we had at IROS last year that, that sort of does, um, puts all three of those together in some sense. It does task planning and motion planning, but also learns from the, um, the environment. And so it has an inner loop that's, oops, uh, where'd they go? It has an inner loop that's much like um, Petlon in the sense that it um, integrates task and motion planning. It does a complete task and motion planning algorithm. It generates a plan. And then the motion planner evaluates the motion cost of each action. And then the learner um, updates the state action values using those motion costs. So basically what I just described um, as Petlon. And then um, this inner loop terminates when the task planner can't find a plan that with, with higher quality. So exactly uh, as Petlon. But then it goes ahead and, um, and so the, well, yeah, I'll give an illustration of this inner loop. The task planner might say, go to door one, open door one, go through door one. And with these costs here, the motion planner says, well, actually, if you try to go to door one, it's going to take you longer than you thought. So then the task planner says, okay, let me try going through door two. The motion planner says, yeah, that'll work. 
And so that's the end. That's the end of its, of its inner loop. Then it goes to the outer loop where it executes this plan. Um, and, uh, and then it updates the action costs using executions in the real environment. And so the inner loop then uses the learned cost to generate an improved plan in the next, in, in the next episode. Um, and so this outer loop you know, can be illustrated as we take the, the plan that we thought was, was best um, going to D2, door two, but now it finds when it tries to execute open door D2 in the real world, it takes a lot longer than it thought um, and or is much more costly. And so now um, this action cost is updated and the inner loop goes back and says, well, now actually going through door one uh, looks more appealing again. So let me go back to that one. Um, and so if we do this, this you know, if we compare TMPCL with, with the two systems that I talked about earlier um, as diagrammed here, then um, the, uh, uh, in a domain like the one that I showed in the motivation where there's, a, there's an optimal plan, which is the shortest uh, number of steps, there's um, a shortest path plan, but, but turns out it has high motion cost. And then there's a, um, another one that has the high cost of opening the door, we can see that they each will, they'll, they'll get to um, different, uh, different points. Um, what we really want to do is, is the, um, the take plan one, the one that has the lowest average execution cost. But if we don't learn from the real world, we'll get stuck on plan two. Um, and, uh, and then if we don't learn efficiently, we'll try this plan three too many times. And so that's exactly what happens. We tried uh, 40 episodes repeated lots of times. Um, and, um, and you can see that uh, that our task in motion planning with cost learning um, gets to the same place as the task planning with, with cost learning. So the same place where Darling would get to, but it does it with um, a lot more, uh, with, with even fewer planner iterations. Um, and task in motion planning gets stuck um, and uh, gets stuck at, the, at, at, the, um, at a suboptimal plan. Um, so, uh, um, and that's just shown here that the task in motion planning doesn't learn from executing in the environment and uh, TBCL has high variance. Um, and this just shows sort of how, how often they, they spend exploring various plans. So task in motion planning always does the same thing over and over again. It doesn't learn from execution. Task, the task planning um, with cost learning, we'll have to look at a lot of other, uh, other plans. Um, and then task in motion planning with cost learning gets to the optimal plan very quickly and stays there. Um, and that's what I said here. Um, so I can show this, uh, the, a demonstration of this. Um, and this just sort of a quick, uh, a quick video demonstration. So this is again, that same uh, building wide intelligent, the BWI bot. Um, and uh, in the example that I showed at the beginning and um, some doors are more likely to be open and some, are, some places are likely to be blocked. I know this is going very quickly, but um, here's you know, various episodes. The first episode, it goes to this door. It has to wait for a person to open the door. So that takes a long time. Um, the second episode, it, uh, it actually finds the right path um, and it goes fairly quickly. The third episode, it tries to go through this, you know, the shortest path met with many steps um, and uh, you know, finds that this is crowded. It fails to execute. Episode four, it, it uh, executes, um, stops at D4, but then goes through. And then I'll just let it run through a few more episodes where it you know, tries to go through the crowded room again, um, tries a sort of a longer plan where it goes to a wrong door and then it has to backtrack. And then finally here, it will um, end up converging to, um, to the optimal plan, which takes about 70 seconds. It finds the right door. Um, and uh, it's learned the task motion plan that, that gets there um, most efficiently. Um, we can also do this in multiple tasks. And um, so uh, if, we, if we start from different places but have the same goal, if we do uh, this TMP with cost learning um, and we start anew from the new goals, then it's, uh, you know, it has to relearn again. Um, but it, if it can store the costs, the motion costs that it's learned from previous tasks, it just can, can keep on uh, using that in, the, in sort of related tasks. Um, so that's basically, you know, that's the, um, the, uh, the main thing I wanted to show. Oops, my laptop battery is low, but um, hopefully I'll be able to get through this. Um, 
uh, I'm going to turn down my brightness. Maybe that'll help. Um, shouldn't affect your brightness. So, um, so uh, we are looking into uh, to multiple robots um, and uh, have done a bunch of um, other planning on, on robot work. And so this is, um, oh, this is the one I just showed actually. Let me show the, uh, We've, um, this is another sort of planning related paper with um, that that's doing multi robot uh, planning under under temporal uncertainty. The the idea here is that we have um, robot a, a robot here in state one that's trying to go to goal one, um, a robot here in state two that's trying to go to goal two. Um, their best plans would be to go through different doors, but they're going to um, end up collaborating um, and go and go through the same door. Um, through a, um, oops, let's see, yeah, and this will show the demonstration of that um, through a, a method, method that we call IIDP for uh, it, um, in, it, uh, iterative something um, planning. I can't remember what the IIDP stands for anymore off the top of my head, but, um, but basically the, the first robot goes to this door, finds that it needs to ask for help to open it because it doesn't have an arm. So, um, uh, I'm going to speed it up a little bit. It um, it goes there and um, and then comes back, asks a person for help, um, and uh, and then um, th this person will uh, will come and, and help the person through the the robot through the door, um, and then the other robot, which you see down in the right corner recognizes that plan through communication and therefore finds that it's easier for it to go through the same door um, as the first robot rather than having to, to deal with opening the second door. And so we show that these are able to sort of plan with for synergies um, along among multiple robots. And then we also use these, and I'm not gonna, I'll stop this video. Um, we've also been, I, I can't go through a talk like this where I'm talking about these, the, the, uh, these service robots um, with learning I'm gonna actually have to plug in my laptop. So hold on one second. And of course my phone is ringing as I go. I'm almost done though. Let me just plug this in. Oh, and it just shut down. Um, hopefully I can recover. No problem, we've got time. Okay. Good, I think I, I got it back, but now, and it's re, is it gonna reboot? Yes, it's a, uh, no, I let it run out. It uh, no, it's just the battery ran out. <laughs> um, so I will, uh, give me one second. And I'll be able to pull it up quickly. Okay, but of course, huh, somehow it still has my screen on the, uh, the, the reason I'm still yeah. here, you can hear me is I'm on the, um, I'm actually doing audio on my iPad. So that's the, that might be confusing, um, but let's see. Uh, good, now I'm getting it back on my, uh, I'll rejoin here. Okay, and I should be back. And now I can share my screen again, and you'll just have to bear with me for one second as I open the talk. Um, um, okay, just quick recovery. Um, I was going to, so I'll, as I'm getting back to that point in the talk, I'll just say, um, you know, I can't give a talk like this where I'm talking about planning and learning on robots motivated by service robots without also mentioning um, that, uh, you know, this is exactly what we do. I'm, I'm right now the president of the RoboCup Federation, the Robot Soccer Federation, and RoboCup at Home is one of the domains, um, one of the uh, domains that we focus on in RoboCup at Home. Um, and, uh, so I can just show you the kinds of tasks we do there. Um, uh, where is it? Um, 
Okay. Um, so, you know, we use these robots that I've, that I've shown you before to do things like, um, like this, like taking out the, uh, like taking out the trash where a robot has to plan to go into an environment, um, to be able to manipulate objects. Um, and in this case, uh, it has to take the lid off of a trash can. It has to pick it up. It has to take it out of the, out of the house. There's multiple trash cans that it has to go in and find. There's other, um, other, uh, tasks like putting away um, groceries that are on a shelf or on a table, putting them on a shelf where the groceries have to be put near each other. Um, this is a fantastic domain, I think, for the kinds of things that this community looks at, and in particular tasks where you just can't do it by just throwing a deep neural network at it. You need to have some kind of, of, um, of, of world model of, of relational representation of, um, of task planning injected in with the motion planning, but also that, you know, that also do amount for um, opportunities for, um, for learning as well. So, um, so the summary of what I've said so far, and I think I am almost out of time, I, I, I'll, um, but I wanted to sort of step back and, and just maybe give a whirlwind of something else. But, but I've, I've introduced TMPCL, a framework for integrating task and motion planning um, and learning for adaptable, on, on, uh, adaptable mobile, mobile robot planning. Um, I've shown experiments on service robots and show that the framework combines uh, the strengths of TMP and CL, TMPCL. We do want to apply this framework to a variety of higher level tasks and evaluate long-term performance. But really, you know, you'll notice it, it didn't fully bridge the gap, right? It's, there's some, it's starting from the planning side. It's patching on some learning. There was some reinforcement learning within Darling. Um, but there's still more we can do. And so I've, you know, this, is, this would sort of be the... the um, the, the you know, closure of all the diagrams that I've shown so far in this talk that uses a, the cost learner, the task planner to, to give us a partial policy to learn the motion planning. We haven't done that yet. And that's, you know, that's something where I think we may be going with, with, uh, with Yu Chen's um, thesis. Um, but you know, I, I started the talk at the beginning for those of you who weren't, uh, who weren't here yet, the, the, um, about you know, sort of talking about how I'm going to focus on this, you know, starting from the planning side and trying to gradually bring in reinforcement learning. I, of course, in my um, in my research career, I've done a lot from the other direction as well, where I've started from the RL side and tried to bring in in planning. Um, and uh, I guess I'll ask you, Alan, how much do I, do I have like a couple more minutes or um, to, to show to just a world a, a teaser of some of that work, or should we um, should we stop and discuss? Let's, uh, you can, yeah, go for a couple more minutes and then we'll, we can okay. have a few questions. Yep. Okay. I'm not going to give, I have many more slides than I have time for, so I'm not going to do it in detail, but I'll just say that we, we have been looking at um, uh, deep R learning. We introduced a, 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 an algorithm called deep R learning for continual area sweeping, motivated by a similar problem. I'll just give the sort of problem formulation and say how it brings planning into it um, in the end. This is a paper that's actually going to be presented at IROS. Uh, next week. Um, but the motivation is that we have an ongoing stream of tasks for the service robot. And, um, and there's some that are long term, like cleaning or surveillance that you don't just plan to finish it, and then you're done. They, they just they go on continually. And, um, and so you know, the, one of those is like coverage path planning, where you you, you want to patrol an area. Um, and, uh, but, but assume you want to you know, keep patrolling, you don't want to just put, sweep it once to see if things are there. But you know, maybe keep continually clean or continual, continually do sort of policing. Um, and so, you know, we don't want to just go back to the same place with all the same places with equal frequency. We want to do this in a non-uniform way in order to efficiently use our travel time. And how do we know that? Well, that's a learning problem. How do we know where the robot needs to be more frequently? If it's a cleaning robot, where gets dirty more quickly? If it's a surveillance robot, where do the interesting things happen more quickly? And so it turns out that in this paper, we say the average reward setting for reinforcement learning isn't quite right because we're trying to maximize detections per second. The number of you know, uh, sort of things to clean up you pick, uh, you, you find over time or the number of interesting events you find over time. So this turns out to be to lend itself much more to an average reward setting, um, and in this so for this paper, you know, it's our lear our learning is an RL classic RL algorithm that's that's designed for the average reward setting, and so we bring this you know sort of in today's fashion, we bring um, deep neural networks as, to, as a function approximator to um, to this problem, modify ex uh, use experience replay and and modify double DQN for its for the purpose. Um, I'm, I'm not like I say I'm not going to go into the details the 
point I want to bring in is that we can, again, bring from the RL side, try to bring in some symbolic knowledge. And the way we do this, um, we create a, a scenario where um, you know, the, the robot is trying to clean up, the trash appears near the person, um, either always or, or most of the time. And so we want to be able to express that to the robot so that it doesn't have to go and, and, um, and look all around the, the world. Um, and so we can use this, you know, sort of bring reward, the, the concept of reward shaping to the average reward formulation of reinforcement learning. And that's the main contribution of this paper. It's that you're using, um, uh, yeah, using shaping rewards, um, as Rao was saying in chat, uh, using shaping rewards and showing what, how that interacts with, um, uh, with our learning. And um, the, uh, we uh, basically use it as a way of, of giving advice. So we can either say, you know, trash only appears in the kitchen or trash appears in all rooms but appears in the kitchen with high probability, or it appears in the corridor and near humans um, with high probability. And, um, and so we can, we actually express this, this is joint work with, uh, with uh, Upuk Topku and his group. We use temporal logic um, specifications to give advice, um, and, but with the, uh, the realization that the advice may not be um, exactly correct. And so we allow the reinforcement learning to be able to sort of be shaped by this, um, and again, I'm not going to go into the details here. I should actually just skip over this um, and, uh, you know, be, be shaped by this, by this symbolic advice, but then still explore in the regions and, and come up with the optimal plans as our, um, as our results show that um, the, the main thing we compare against is, is a technique called shielding that uses the symbolic um, knowledge as, as given. It prevents the robot from ever deviating from it. And that, of course, is too rigid for a for a dynamic kind of situation. So we instead use this as a as a um, for the purpose of reward shaping, and um, and uh, yeah. So the you know the sum the summary here. This is that was a complete whirlwind. The the paper is is in IROS. Um, part of that work is in IROS next week. Part of it's under review at a different conference. Um, but uh, but that's you know that that's sort of just to give a flavor of this coming from the other direction, starting from reinforcement learning and adding in some um, some aspects of planning as opposed to the rest of the talk, which was starting from the planning side um, and adding in some aspects of of learning. And so you know, I'll return to the to the title slide of the main main uh, work that I have uh, been talking about, and then I'll be happy to to stop and and uh, and answer any questions. I see that the the chat has been super active during the talk and it's I almost wanted to stop and, and give my opinion on some of the conversations going there but that would have been a little too distracting I'll have to comb through the chat uh, afterwards and see what everybody said I'm sure I hope I didn't offend anybody though well thanks a lot yeah I, I didn't see any offenses taken from, from you at least <laughs> maybe from Rao but uh, yeah thanks a lot that was, that was a great talk um uh, wow, you're you're really quite a multitasker. If you can, I know. I mean, 